Right. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for BlueLock's webinar, How to Protect Your Data and Apps from a Zombie Apocalypse and Other Less Likely Disasters. My name is John Corwin. I'm BlueLock's Senior Digital Marketing Coordinator and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Our presenters today are BlueLock's Chief Technology Officer, Pat O'Day, and our Sales Engineer, Craig Herring. A few housekeeping items to cover before we get started. Uh, please feel free to submit any questions or comments you have throughout the presentation using the chat or Q&A panels within the WebEx tool. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure and uh, tackle those at the end of the session. We also encourage you to tweet about the session uh, using the hashtag BLRAS. Lastly, we are recording this presentation and we'll, and we'll be sure to send you the video recording and a copy of the webinar slides within the next few business days. This webinar will last one hour. During the session, Pat will show you how to architect a recovery as a service or RAS solution, provide live demos of cloud-based disaster recovery, including a live failover, and explore how disaster recovery in the cloud makes your DR solution more cost-effective, simple, and efficient. At the conclusion of Q&A, one lucky webinar attendee will be selected to win today's giveaway, an Apple iPad Mini, so be sure to stay till the end. And with that, I'll hand the reins off to Pat. Awesome. Thanks, John. Hey, everybody. So, uh, I'll just forget that pop-up iPad picture that shows <laughs> right. up on there. Um, so, today is really pretty demo-oriented. Uh, we are going to talk at a high level about the architecture and some of the reasons why people are going to the recovery as a service, but what we really want to focus on is making sure you see how easy it is to set this up and how effective it is when you actually need it the most. Um, we're using a company that we created called GreatCo, and GreatCo is a summary of uh, basically all the learning we've had working with actual customers in the field, uh, and they face a lot of the same challenges that uh, a lot of you do out in the real world. Um, Greatco, uh, one of the reasons we love Greatco so much is they use one of just about every Blue Lock product that we've ever uh, made. Um, on this picture here, you can see they have their own vSphere environment, and they've also, and they're here in the Midwest, um, they've also got some two series virtual data centers that we host for them. They use those for development testing and uh, just ad hoc needs. If they need 30 machines for the weekend to throw them away on Monday, they can do that. They're also hosting a couple production apps that made more sense to run in our environment than in their own data center uh, out in uh, five series virtual data centers, which are more about production, four nines of uptime, et cetera, so on. And uh, what we're going to feature today is their use of a four series virtual data center, which is uh, a backup recovery target. So this is really just storage. So they're replicating their vSphere environment here over the network into a Blue Lock 4 Series virtual data center uh, at a Blue Lock facility in Las Vegas. So if we explode that in a little bit more detail, you can see that um, they're using things both in uh, our Indianapolis location and Las Vegas. But what we're going to talk about here primarily is their vSphere environment, which is down here. And using recovery as a service, they're actually able to replicate internal applications into the cloud, into a Blue Lock 4 series virtual data center, and uh, protect them. So if anything would happen to this vSphere environment here, they could power this environment up and keep going. So if we look at that more on a national map, this is the map we're going to use as we show different scenarios that might impact their production environment. Uh, they're doing the replication over the internet through a VPN tunnel. You can do the replication over MPLS, a point-to-point -point circuit. Uh, TW Telecom has a new product called eLink that's uh, much more efficient in terms of uh, internet bandwidth or the network bandwidth. It works more like the cloud. You only pay for what you use. But there are lots of different ways to do that. Um, but Great Code today is using the internet. Virtual data center, you heard me mention that a couple times, and just so it's clear what we mean, uh, what that means in our terminology, uh, it's a pool of uh, really those data center components, so CPU, RAM, and storage, as well as uh, network capacity. And virtual data centers, because they're cloud-based, they're software constructs, 
you can actually change the amount of any of these anytime you want, and you can have as many as you like. So if you needed three virtual data centers for three different projects, you could do that. If you wanted uh, to take a fairly small one, like this one, with you know just a few resources in it and quadruple the size, uh, you can do that as well. And then you can shrink them back down if you don't need them anymore, or, or throw them away. Um, as I mentioned, the 4-series virtual data center is really ideal for DR, and recovery as a service because during normal circumstances, the only infrastructure that you're uh, paying for here is the storage cost. So if you have a terabyte of data in your environment running an application, uh, the, you're, you back that up into the Blue Lock environment and you consume a terabyte of data in the 4 Series Virtual Data Center and everything is fine. Uh, and you replicate changes out there, keep it up to date, and we'll show you how that works. And only when you would go to test the environment uh, or declare a disaster, dynamically all that other stuff just shows up because it's the cloud. And I, I literally mean it just shows up. You hit the play button to bring the VMs back and uh, the software automatically assigns you um, all the CPU and RAM and network capacity that you need, which is absolutely critical. Uh, but it also makes it super efficient because you're not using that, you're not having to deal with that stuff if you don't need it. And the testing, we actually do two tests per year uh, with you that uh, we don't charge for as long as you schedule those with some advance mm -hmm. notice. So uh, only really when you would declare a disaster do those resources actually impact you. Oh, John, what's this? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Pat. looks like we've got to interrupt the presentation for some type of emergency broadcast. Let's, let's tune in and hear what this, this breaking news is all about. This is CNN Breaking News. What is certain is that this seemingly unexplainable mass hysteria continues to spread throughout the heartland with injuries reported to be in the thousands. We now go live to Catherine Lanfear at St. Augustine Memorial Hospital. Catherine. David, the staff here says they haven't seen anything close to the sheer volume of casualties. Badly injured, very frightened people are pouring in, no exaggeration, by the hundreds. And we're told that most of the injuries are bites, not gunshot or stab wounds, as we were led to believe earlier. Oh, boy. Just a few minutes ago, we spoke with one of the doctors that has been on call since this morning when the patients arrived. We have seen cases of complete digit finger extraction. Deep throat laceration, even a large section of flesh torn away as if by a rabbit dog or a wild animal. We've been told by nurses there have been complications. Almost all wounds have shown immediate infection. Uh, many have went into toxic shock. Uh, one patient... Have there been fatalities? Uh, uh, excuse me, please. I'm sorry, I have to go. I was coming home from work, and I saw this woman in the road. She was moaning or something, so I... I went out to go see, I thought she got hit by a car or something, something like that, and I went to go reach out to help her, and she bit me in the arm, oh, scratched up goodness. my face, and I just took off. And Doctors are still at a loss as to the reason behind these attacks, and the situation doesn't seem to be improving. The past few minutes, I've seen four ambulances and several cars pull up with victims seeking emergency care. Whatever's going on, it seems to be far from over. David? Thank you, Catherine. Speculation seems to surround the origin of this phenomenon. The theories include an airborne plague, a toxic chemical spill, bioterrorism, and even a space-borne virus. The viewers should be advised that there is no official explanation as of yet. Teams from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Center for Disease Control, and Office of Emergency Preparedness have been dispatched to Chicago, Madison, and the Twin Cities. Hmm. All right. So, Madison, Wisconsin, that's awfully close to our production data center for Greatco. So, what we're going to go ahead and do is instead of showing you a test failover, we're going to go ahead and uh, start an actual failover. I always find it an amazing coincidence that we happen to be ready just as the zombie outbreak starts to occur. <laughs> so um, I'm logging into uh, Blue Lock Portfolio, which is the uh, environment or the application you use to manage your environment at Blue Lock. And you can see 
see everything's operating great out there in the cloud. We've got all green lights. I'm logging in the great co-environment. You can see I've got a two series, a four series, and a five series virtual data center. I'll just hop into the uh, four series environment here. And I'm gonna go to manage it. <clears throat> and what you can see is that right now, because there's nothing actually running there, it's completely empty. So just storage. Uh, let the screens catch up here. Uh, so you can see it's just storage in the environment. There are no actually actual running virtual machines. So in order to fail everything over, I'm gonna log into the vSphere client, uh, which most of you are probably familiar with if you manage your VMware environment. Uh, because I've installed the software appliance from Zerto, which does the replication, I've got this extra tab in Virtual Center. And you can see that I'm replicating from my local site out to zone one at Blue Lock. And what I'm actually replicating out there is this thing called a VPG or virtual protection group. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those are in a minute. I'm kind of in a hurry to fail this, start this failover. Uh, but if I open it up, you can see that uh, I've got a couple, two VMs. So this is my ERP application that manages all my supply chain and some of my cash register stuff for Graco uh, and stores all the data for that. It's inside of that VPG. My recurrent recovery point objective, because I'm using continuous data protection, is actually really low at you know, four, eight seconds. So that, that data is really up to date that's out there at the backup site. I'm gonna flip this bit here and switch it from a test failover to a live failover. Uh, I, Interestingly enough, you can also use this to move VMs around. So if you're trying to do cloud migrations, uh, this technology works great for that as well. Now that I've hit the failover button, you can see uh, I've got one VPG selected here. If you wanted to fail five or six VPGs or 10 or 20, you could do all those at the same time, but I just am gonna fail this one. A um, Couple things to note here. You can automatically commit the failover which means that the minute that the backup environment fires up, the production environment at uh, the source location will turn off. Uh, what we typically will do is we'll actually do a delay. So we'll do, you know, you can do 30 minutes, you can do 10 minutes, an hour, whatever you think works. And that gives you some time to actually log into the failover site, kick the tires, make, it, make sure the application works and everything goes. And then you can allow it to fully commit over, or if you're ready for it to commit, you can just tell it to go ahead and commit right away. Uh, because this is uh, just a demo today, even though we're acting like it's real, it is, it is just a demo. I'm gonna use auto rollback, which means that it'll power up the test site, make sure everything works, and then if I don't tell it to commit, it'll automatically just shut the test site down and uh, take everything back to normal. And the replication continues through this entire process. So even if you did an, a test or a, uh, a just basically a test recovery, let's say you spent four hours working on a test environment, the continuous data protection continues the whole way through that. So you didn't impact your RPO just because you were doing some, some testing, which is kind of cool. Uh, the other thing that you might do here, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, is you might change the checkpoint. So right now we've got this set at uh, the latest and greatest, basically give me the environment as, it's, as it stands with the latest uh, replication. But let's say that data was corrupt for some reason, you might need to roll back an hour or so. And you can roll back you know, an hour, four hours, 20 hours, pretty much uh, as far as you wanna go up to about 48 hours, depending on how much storage you allocate for the journal uh, to keep all those track of all those changes. But I'm not going to do that just yet, so we'll just go ahead and fail over. And uh, you can see down here the progress bar. The failover process has started. This is one of those crazy progress bars that uh, jumps right up to 22%, and it'll probably sit there for about 8 to 10 minutes. Uh, and then it'll magically jump up to 79. It'll sit there for a little while longer, and then it'll finish. So uh, 
probably could smooth that out. But, but anyway, it is moving right along. It's actually failing the environment over. And what you can see if I go back over here into the backup site, the portal, is that um, the nothing is here yet. I'll wait for the screen to refresh. There we go. So nothing's in the virtual data center yet, but if I refresh it, what we'll see is that the, uh, the, v, the VPG has appeared. It just has no virtual machines in it. So there it is. So it's appeared. It's starting to instantiate itself. And as the VMs become available, they'll actually appear over here and start to power themselves up automatically. All right. So if we go back to, uh, we're going to give that, a, you know, just like a cooking show, we're going to give that a little bit of time <laughs> in the oven for that to, to bake, and uh, we'll talk about some other stuff while that's while the failover is actually going on. So the things we looked at uh, during that demo, we talked about a virtual protection group, which is basically a container you put the VMs in in order to protect them. Recovery time objective, we didn't talk about that because it's so small. I mean, I hit the power button, and in 15 minutes or so, when those VMs are powered back up, that's it. Uh, you can configure two sites to act as hot sites with each other and get down into seconds or minutes if that's important for your application. But we consider, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to fail over an environment a pretty good RTO these days. And a recovery point objective, we went through that. That's how fresh and current that backup copy of your data is, and you saw that, you know, in the 30, 40 seconds or so. Um, the other thing that I didn't talk about but that we're doing is we're actually using a sandbox network. So instead of failing it over and putting the backup site on the production network, uh, you can put it in a sandbox network. That allows you to uh, basically not ha let that application have access to the real world. You can test it, make sure everything's good, and then open up the networking uh, if you want. And that's really useful because the last thing you want is to do a DR test and then have users accidentally go to your backup environment instead of the production environment because the network was confused about which, which way people should go. Um, so while we're waiting for the failover, let's talk a little bit about why you would do disaster recovery in the cloud uh, instead of maybe a more traditional approach like tapes or um, putting a lot of bunch of stuff in a colo somewhere. So obviously, uh, zombie threats are on the rise. This may uh, is clearly evidenced by the fact that there appears to be an event breaking out in Madison, Wisconsin right now. Uh, but this is also real data. We actually collected this from uh, Hollywood. Uh, we know they're a very uh, solid, stable, uh, and truthful source of information. Um, there were two films with zombies uh, in them in the 1920s. And you can see that just, uh, you know, very recently in 2009, uh, there were almost 50 films that had uh, zombie apocalypses featured in them. So the odds that what Hollywood is sort of showing us will meet reality sometime soon just get worse every year. So we we're curious, uh, we're going to pop up a little poll real quick. And we're curious, you know, what, what you guys would do uh, if the apocalypse struck your environment today. That poll should now be showing on your screen. You can submit those answers. It's a uh, multiple choice. All right, so hopefully you guys have uh, a good plan ready in case that would happen. Uh, but I guess the poll will tell the truth. So um, the other thing that's happening is the number of actual disasters that occur also appears to be on the rise. And I, you know, I, I watch CNN uh, every day. I check out the website just to see what's going on around the world. And it seems like, you know, nine out of ten stories are, are disasters. Something's gone wrong, something somewhere in the world. Um, there's the occasional tenth story thrown in there about twerking or, uh, you know, Beyonce, you know, upsetting Target or whatever. But the majority of stories are, are all about uh, things going wrong. And I, I don't know that necessarily there's more stuff going wrong. Everybody likes to blame global warming. Um, but I also think just the amount of people uh, on the earth and the number of applications and the importance of infrastructure uh, are really the factors. So there are places where there are mission critical applications running for businesses uh, where there didn't used to be people, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So when 
there's a wildfire there or something goes wrong, the impact of that on, uh, on us is much greater uh, than it would have been. That and the fact that it's not just email that's an inconvenience, it's down for a couple days. Uh, it's actually your e-commerce site that's down for a couple days and now you're affecting you know, the bottom line. Things that EIT is working on and responsible for are affecting the bottom line, not just back office stuff. So the patterns we tend to see uh, are very similar to what you'd imagine. So out on the West Coast, uh, the customers we work with out there, you know, their primary concern is an earthquake. Uh, there have been some notable incidents uh, in our history, and they have a really significant outage footprint. So they'll affect multiple cities. Uh, the incidents tend to stay on the coast. So getting as far inland as the Blue Lock facility in Las Vegas seems to be uh, adequate in terms of protection. The uh, other issue, if you look out at the East Coast, a very similar uh, situation in terms of the size of the events that can affect our customers out there, but um, from a different problem. So hurricane threats are the primary issue that they worry about. And again, those will affect multiple cities and multiple regions, but coming far enough inland to uh, a place like uh, Indianapolis, where we have another facility, seems to be effective enough to mitigate that risk for them. Where things get a little more interesting is in the central U.S. So uh, the, we worry, we do have, uh, that's where we're from. So we have earthquakes uh, to a degree. We have you know pretty significant rainstorms to a degree, but we certainly don't have uh, hurricanes and, uh, and things like east and west coast. What we do have are all these little tactical problems like floods, um, that you know, fill up a data center with water if the water table gets a little too high. Uh, hail can take out condensers on the roof and disrupt your power. So can ice storms. Um, there's nothing worse than having your air conditioner go offline. Uh, even though you you know you put two air conditioners in, you put all the condensers up on the roof, and next thing you know, the fans stop spinning because they're full of ice, and and your HVAC is offline, and your data center's down. Um, high winds, tornadoes, those things are very real. Uh, out here, uh, but what, it, oh, and of course, as we're now learning, the zombie apocalypse is another issue. Um, that's why uh, most of our customers in the uh, U.S. will either uh, jump one city over to Indianapolis or they'll go all the way out to Vegas if they're really concerned about a broader issue. Um, so what, the, the key thing is most of those threats are more tactical. In other words, they're going to strike uh, sort of one city at a time, maybe a little bit broader footprint than that and affect a metro region. But, you know, typically getting across one state line uh, away or two is, is good enough to protect you there. Um, the other thing that's occurring and that's making cloud-based disaster recovery more appealing to people is the fact that cloud is pretty real now. Uh, so, you know, something along the lines of, I think, 60 or 80 percent of people are using it in some way, shape, or form. And I don't throw that statistic out that I don't know the difference between 60 and 80 percent. That's a pretty big gap. It's that's really has more to do with whether people, how people define what cloud is. So if you throw software you know, as a service in there, the vast majority of companies have are using Dropbox or Salesforce or some sort of SaaS application uh, a lot, but fewer, you know, 38%, uh, according to Gartner, are using infrastructure as a service in some form today. So it's, it's quickly gone from a pure hype train to something that, in the right use case, can actually be pretty useful and effective. Um, so it's nice, uh, I guess, to think that uh, cloud is more uh, adopted than it has ever been. You certainly have these disasters that seem to be uh, creeping up on us worse than they have before. But if you didn't have really good technology like what we're demoing to you today, uh, you really wouldn't be able to tap into the cloud the way that you need to. So um, cloud brings some of that on its own. So there's a low barrier to entry if you just need to protect one virtual machine and you only need to protect it for three months out of the year. It's great because you only pay for exactly what you use. Uh, thanks to VMware, primarily, uh, we're using VMs now, not physical hardware. So as those of you that administer VMware environments know, uh, it's really easy to bring VMs back to life. You just hit the power button. If, as long as they have resources, they power right back up. So recovery quality is really strong. 
uh, self-service interface, as we showed you there, um, that's the same console that a user of our service would have, uh, the one that I'm using. And uh, it's easy to use. You go in, you protect stuff, you decide you want to test it, you go and you power it back up, you're done testing it, you click the power button and you power it back off. Um, this, uh, because we're, all this is working at the hypervisor level, it's SAN agnostic. So um, whether you have EMC or HDS or NetApp, it really doesn't matter. As long as it will run uh, through a hypervisor, you can protect it. That means it's all software-based, so it's super flexible. So not only can you go from one VM to protecting 50 VMs, uh, the amount of resources that you need are very dynamic as well. You can change the networking around. You're really never dealing with anything to do with, with hardware. Uh, and all this is application aware. So instead of protecting one VM and then going and figuring out that you needed to power up another VM that's supplying some sort of uh, data resource to that primary application VM, you can group all those together in uh, VPGs and fail them all over at the same time. Really cool to be able to basically send uh, the web server, or let's say you've got five web servers, a load balancer as a virtual appliance, a firewall, and a database server all in one VPG and uh, bring them all back online together. And you can control the boot order, so you can make sure that the directory services comes up and is running uh, before the web servers and database servers come online. Uh, so how does all that work in terms of, let's say I, I want to get started and just go protect something right now. So we'll do, uh, let's see what our progress bar shows here. Oh, it's actually done. So, uh, so we're failed over. And if I hit the refresh button here, we should see that the VMs are now up and running at the backup site. And there they are. So you can see the consoles are up and running. They're powered up. So great co, I now have an exact copy of my ERP application running in Las Vegas uh, that's the same as my Indianapolis location. And because I set that auto rollback, if I don't go in and tell this to go ahead and commit, which you can see in the screen over here, um, if I hit the commit button, it'll go ahead and power that environment up and uh, turn off production. Or if I want to purge it and reclaim my resources, I can go ahead and roll it back. But uh, what I want to show you now is how to, and that's going to happen automatically, so I'm not going to bother to push the button. But uh, I realized that um, my in testing that my ERP application actually depends on uh, Active Directory and on a file server. So there's a bunch of data that users, I thought they had uploaded it all into the ERP application. Apparently, they're keeping it on the F drive. So I'm going to go ahead and protect that F drive. So what I need to do here is create a new VPG, and I'm just going to call this... Uh, uh, let's call it ERP miscellaneous. That way I can add other servers in here. Uh, if I figure that out later, that there's even more that these guys need. I'm going to pick my uh, 4 series VDC that I've already got set up. So you can put more than one of these VPGs in a v VDC. And then I'll go ahead and add uh, these two servers here. And if I can find my scroll bar. Ah, where did it go? There we go. Click OK. And now those are uh, part of the VPG. And as soon as I would hit the Save button, the replication would automatically start and send those out to, uh, to Vegas, and they'd be protected as well. So that's pretty easy. All right. So how does it all work at an architectural level? So just as a refresh, I know we have some people on the call who aren't as familiar with virtualization as others. We won't spend a long time on this. But it really does depend a lot on virtualization. So virtualization, uh, you know, in the old world, we used to have one physical server. And on top of that, we would have one you know, Windows operating system. It could be Linux, uh, Red Hat, what have you and then we had one application running on it, like an email service. Uh, in virtualization, we added this cool thing called the hypervisor that basically abstracted the hardware so that we can then get more resources, uh, get more utilization out of that same piece of equipment. So, you know, you might have six different applications running on that physical server, and those are what we, we call virtual machines. All right. So Greatco, as we mentioned, has a vSphere environment, and in their uh, vSphere cluster, they have 
gobs and gobs and gobs of these virtual machines. There we go. So to set up, uh, as I showed you in the, the actual user interface, if I wanted to protect an application, I pick which virtual machines I need to protect, and I put them inside what's called a uh, virtual protection group. So it's that simple. And I, I might protect three of those VMs, one application, I could protect them all. It really depends on uh, what you want to do as a business. So then, um, now that I've got that VPG, that first VPG created, I need to pick a backup location. I, I, I want to be out in Vegas because um, I feel I have to tour the data center, uh, the backup data center every quarter, and uh, <laughs> I'd rather go to Vegas uh, than Indianapolis. No offense to Indy, I was born there, so I, I know what that's all about. Um, so uh, I picked then a four series virtual data center, and it, uh, as soon as I hit the replication button, this backup VPG starts out there and I can start replicating data into that environment. Uh, in this case, you know, I could do this over the internet, but I, we think that doing this over something like a TW e-link is better, uh, just because it makes it a little bit more uh, predictable and uh, affordable to move uh, big chunks of data when you initially set your replication up. We're happy to tell you guys more about that, or if uh, TW is already a network provider for you, you can call your, your local folks and they'll fill you in on that. So now I've got the uh, replication going, and because we're using continuous data protection, the way we get those really aggressive recovery points, uh, recovery point objectives, is because every time a change block is written in memory in my vSphere environment, uh, as it's written to disk, it is also simultaneously sent out to uh, the backup site. The way that works is vSphere has what's called a file filter driver inside, or a filter driver inside of it, and that filter driver allows third-party tools uh, that are authorized by you, like uh, the ones that we use, to actually take copies of uh, the writes that go to your array. So now that uh, that environment's current, um, you're protected. When you would do a failover, as we said, you have an event, let's call it a prolonged power outage out in your production environment. You then hit the failover button like we showed you, and eventually your production environment goes back online. You can fail back out of this solution, and it works exactly the opposite way. So let's say your environment's down for three days, uh, but it does come back online because it wasn't destroyed due to fire or flooding. Um, you actually then set the replication back up, replicate the data back out, your issue goes away, and the uh, backup environment. And that's because the replication technology we use is bi-directional. You can establish source and destination sites however you want to go. Um, after you've got that first VPG up and running, if you decided you had another application or two you wanted to protect, uh, the coolest thing is the a Blue Lock 4 Series Virtual Data Center can hold up to about 250 VPGs, so there's a lot of scale there that you can leverage. Uh, if for some reason you had 250 VPGs, uh, we would just set you up with another four series virtual data center and you could keep going. Uh, I would say most people today only have you know five or six, so uh, 250 is a pretty big number. Uh, Component-wise, so we've talked a lot about how uh, Zerto works and, and what it does. So let's talk about how it actually fits into your vSphere environment. So um, as we mentioned before, you know, you've got your, your, your data center here. This is vSphere. And inside of vSphere, you know, you've got all these VMs. You might have 20. You might have, uh, you know, 2,000. Uh, vSphere environments can vary greatly in the number of VMs that they have. Uh, as we showed you before, you create this virtual protection group. It's basically a folder. And then you select which VMs you want to protect, right? We've covered that so far. In terms of how the magic happens, uh, for every ESX host you have that has a protected VM running on it, this uh, little appliance called a VRA or virtual replication appliance will automatically spawn to access that filter driver I mentioned before and intercept any writes that go to disk for the VMs that are protected. So if a, a, if a you know, PowerPoint file or a notepad file or a database changes in this VM, as that data is written here, the VRA will actually intercept it and send a copy of it out to the uh, to the backup site. If a VM changes here, 
Uh, it'll pass through, but because it's not in a virtual protection group, that change won't actually be sent to the backup site. The other thing that you saw was that little tab that appears in Virtual Center that allows you to administer all this. That is created when you install this uh, virtual machine or, or a software appliance called a ZVM, and that's the Zerto virtual machine. The minute that you upload that into your environment and you give it uh, credentials to operate uh, inside a virtual center, it will create the tab that you saw that gives you the self-service capability to protect, determine what VMs you're going to protect, what you're not going to protect, test your failover, pretty much everything that you saw uh, me do. So if we sort of roll all that together in one picture, uh, you can see we've got the VPGs here, we've got the hosts here, the VRAs, virtual center, et cetera. So if I go into the ZVM, I create uh, that gives me my tab in virtual center. I create this VPG. I put some VMs in it. Every time a block is written from this VM into the array, the VRA intercepts that write, sends it across the VPN tunnel, and keeps this backup copy of the VPG of that VM completely up to date. So uh, the other thing that I didn't mention to you is, uh, and a lot of you I'm sure have remote offices, back offices, maybe retail sites, manufacturing facilities of some kind. Uh, oh, John, what's this? Oh, uh, gosh, I'm I'm sorry, Pat. It seems that we're we're having a uh, another intermission here. It seems like the the situation is getting getting worse outside. Uh, I think we have another breaking news update here. Uh, Let's go ahead and tune in and hear what they have to say on this, this so-called zombie apocalypse. Mm, this is concerning. This is coming out of Chicago, so that means Madison, uh, it, it, it's spreading. It's getting pretty close to Graco's uh, data center. Look, I'm sorry, we have to cut away right now. I, who knows that this report will ever be transmitted. Uh, communication is at best limited. limited. The city, it seems, is being overrun with man-eating creatures. And Okay, well that's not good. I'm I'm glad I'm glad we went ahead and failed uh, failed our ERP application over. Um, so I, I think at this point it probably makes sense to go ahead and commit it to full production. Um, yeah, sure enough, it's in Chicago now. Uh, so. Uh, Great Co. is actually a pizza company, so we have a lot of pizza stores throughout the country, and uh, as you know, during an apocalypse, the last thing everybody wants to do is cook dinner, so we expect a lot of deliveries are going to come in uh, over the next, a lot of orders for deliveries are going to come in over the next couple days, so we need to make sure these stores can continue to operate. Um, all the stores that we have are actually connected to an MPLS network provided by TW Telecom, Oh, yep, now it's spreading down in the, sort of the Alabama area. Um, Atlanta, maybe. Uh, so anyway, um, sorry, I'm getting a little nervous. The apocalypse is getting a little out of control for me right now. Uh, so all these stores are connected to the MPLS cloud. Uh, we've also got the production grade code data centers connected uh, to the MPLS cloud, and that's how everybody gets to the ERP application to order more dough and uh, bread and uh, breadsticks and cheese and sauce and all that good stuff that we put on the pizza. Um, it's also how the uh, we process all the credit card transactions, so it's really important to keep that. Keep that you know, now it's down there in the Arkansas area. This is not good, kind of getting surrounded. So um, fortunately, we had the foresight. We went ahead and connected the backup site to that MPLS network so that if anything would ever happen to the production site, we could, we could fail over. Uh, so, oh, yeah, now they're up in Michigan. That's not good. Um, so, uh, how do you do that, right? So the good news is we have the network in place, but um, it does require a little bit of rejiggering to get those sites to go from the production environment to, to the backup environment. Uh, most people will do that through modifying their DNS and by setting the TTL settings down to uh, zero or something like 30 seconds. That works for both public and private IP addressing. The numbers will be different, and you're going in the front of the firewall, not behind the firewall, but the DNS and TTL changes are, are pretty universal. So, uh, Craig, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to um, run through how to make those changes here. So we've got the Windows DNS Manager up, right? Yes, that's correct. Yep. And so here we're just going to uh, here change the uh, setting to advanced so we can uh, see those settings. 
So as we do that, we're going to change the TTL here. We're going to go ahead and do zero for this demo. Then click OK. Just run a quick little ping test. Yep, we can see that we got traffic flowing. And it looks like for right now, because we haven't actually made any changes, we're still connected to the production production location. That is correct. Okay. Oh, John. Gosh. Getting I, worse. I I don't know what's going on. This is pretty serious stuff. Uh, apparently the emergency broadcast system has issued some sort of warning for all civilians. Let's let's tune in. Yeah, and this looks like it might even be local or something. I, that uh <laughs> Uh-oh, unbelievable. You know that noise. The following message is transmitted at the request of the Indianapolis State Police Department. Mm. So it's here. authorities have issued a warning for the following counties, Hendricks and Marion. At 2.35 p.m., reports from these counties have issued an outbreak of a highly contagious virus. Some reports claim the outbreak started in the Hendricks and Harrion County hospitals. Symptoms of this virus include loss of coordination, confusion, and eventually, certain death. <laughs> reports have also claimed that those infected have acted out in an extremely violent behavior. Citizens are extremely advised to avoid anyone with these symptoms. At this time, these counties are under quarantine until further notice. Okay, so uh, unfortunately, it sounds like the outbreak is has finally made it to Indianapolis, and uh, so we're going to go ahead and fail all the pizza stores over because uh, we, we're pretty sure that data center is going to going to drop at any minute here. Uh, hopefully not, but you know, just in case, we're going to fail over. So now we've redirected all the stores over to the backup site out in Vegas. Craig, can you make the uh, the DNS changes to make that happen for us? Yeah, let's go ahead. So here uh, we're just going to go back into that uh, same uh, little web server we're showing. We're going to change the IP address here, and because we changed the TTL down to zero, uh, we're going to we're going to notice here that the change happens almost immediately. So I'm going to just clear uh, clear the DNS cache of, of the machine here real quick, and then uh, we're going to run one last uh, ping test just to validate and make sure our IP address is in fact changed. So we're just going to go ahead and clear the DNS, and then uh, yep, going to go ahead and run the pings, and we can see that we're we're connected now to the uh, second site. Awesome. So I, I was on the phone with one of the pizza stores. They said there was a little bit of a hiccup. Uh, the screen uh, lagged for a minute, and now they're back in business taking orders. So I think we're good. Sounds great. All right. So um, one final thing that I, I showed briefly was this idea of recovery checkpoints. So uh, those are useful when uh, you know something like uh, human error might be your your source of failure. So the um, idea being that, uh, you know, whether it's uh, someone pushed a bad code release, uh, maybe it was malicious, a uh, virus outbreak happened in your environment. The challenge with continuous data protection is the minute data changes in your environment, whether it's good or bad, it automatically gets replicated to your backup site. So um, you may end up recovering to an environment that uh, has the same virus that your production environment does. So being able to roll back and say, I want to go back in time and actually recover an hour pri prior to the incident uh, can be really useful. Oh, that's <laughs> that's not good. So, um, John, this looks like is this surveillance footage from uh, from our developer shop? Yeah, it looks like they just patched this feed in. Okay. Um, so thanks to the IT guys just sort of throwing this on our screen here to keep us aware of what's going on. That's actually uh, Bob Johnson. Bob is our head uh, developer on our ERP application, and it unfortunately looks like Bob was uh, infected by the virus prior to uh, pushing code out into production. So they're telling me that the production site uh, is corrupt, that failover we just did. So um, we're going to go ahead and go back and use those recovery points. It looks like the from the, the uh, tag here on the screen that happened about 115. 
So, uh, Craig, if you could, could you hop over and just do the failover again, and but roll it back to like 1 p.m.? Yeah. Uh, that should be good. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Okay. So while Craig's doing that, um, what he's doing is uh, basically going back into that VPG, and in the failover, he's going to slide this slider back so that it actually occurs uh, at a checkpoint prior to 1.15 p.m. when we knew we had our, our bad uh, data out there. And uh, the failover process works exactly the same. Uh, so it'll take, again, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes for it to fail over. And uh, we'll need to log in and test it, make sure that the corruption's not in there. But then we, we should be good to go. Yep, easy to do. Oh, it looks like... Uh, wow. Seems like the, the government is here to help. The, the White House has something to say. <laughs> the president wants to make it perfectly clear that this is not a case of bioterrorism. No kidding. No such agents exist in the arsenal of any nation or known terrorist group. He also wants to stress the need for calm and respect for law and order. The quicker people can get off the streets and into their homes, the quicker the appropriate federal and state agencies can reach these troubled areas. Although a further call-up of reservists is on the table, our current overseas military assets will remain in place to reassure our allies that this is a minor containable situation that we expect to see fully resolved in 24 hours or less. Okay, good. So it sounds like everything is under control. Um, so uh, I don't think any of you need to panic. Uh, we're going to stay here. Uh, we've got enough ammo to probably last us till tomorrow, and by then I think the, you know, the, the police will have it all taken care of. But the main thing is we just want to congratulate everybody on the session. You're now officially Z experts because you have been trained on how to recover in the event of, uh, recover your applications in the event of a zombie apocalypse. You probably didn't know you were going to get certified today. Maybe the easiest certification you've ever gotten. Um, if you want, we can 